Okay, well, we are at 11.30, so uh, keep the program moving here. I'd like to bring on our next speaker, uh, and this is uh, Warren Roberts, who is a faculty member at Rio Hondo Community College and uh, is well known for his work with drones and training many uh, county and other local employees around the, the region in, in drones and in GIS and, and all other things geospatial. So we're honored to have Warren here uh, to speak with us today about survey mapping with drones. And with that, I will uh, give it over to you, Warren. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, I've been around for a while uh, with uh, teaching GIS at Rehonda College. Uh, my background is in landscape architecture. Uh, all of our classes as of right now through this to the summer next year are online. Uh, fortunately, we can access our classrooms remotely. And we do have classes starting in the spring, um, February 1st, if you're interested. What I wanted to cover today is what I was I got involved in in 2012 working on projects out in um, uh, at the time, was on Borneo with some pretty large drones. Uh, but today, um, we try to incorporate it into all of our classes. And um, uh, what my goal today is just to give you an idea where to start. Because when I started this, uh, I, I uh, didn't have much guidance at all. So that's what we uh, try to do in, in all of our classes, show you what the, what the trends are. And today, definitely with the drones, I, could, I can assure you. Uh, it's like when I started teaching good, some 20 years ago, uh, the GPS um, was a big thing. Everyone's got GPS now in their back pocket. And back then, um, and they, were, they, were, they, they weren't as accurate as they used to be, but now we all use them. Uh, today, it, it's like the drones today, but they're going to change a lot quicker and uh, a lot less expensive. Uh, the industry is, is growing. And in fact, of course, videography is pretty large with the use of drones, but survey mapping would be next in line. And then you can apply it over. And I work with a lot of ecologists, environmental technology folks, planning, uh, fire and police. The applications are across the board. So hashtag if I was a student, I definitely look into something like this to add into your portfolio and your LinkedIn. And uh, we do have courses that I mentioned that we actually have industry folks teaching our classes and our course material is guided by industry with advisories. Uh, and we found that uh, that drones are um, are um, pretty easy to use. And uh, they are autonomous. And there is a, a, a large growth, especially when we get beyond visual line of sight, VLIS, visual line of sight. At some of the constraints that we have as well as the battery and plus the idea with drones flying above it isn't good for uh, a lot of folks but uh, there are ways to uh, to work with them they're kind of noisy uh, but yes industry helps us uh, build our programs in fact uh, there's map dude i don't think he's here today but uh, there's renee he's with la city fire and uh, i think it's i think it's a game changer it definitely is in fact uh some of the industries here listed uh, survey mapping is one of the top in um, in the amount of um, uh, uh, use of the drones. I mean, if you look back at some of the applications in the past, I mean, why would you want to do this, right? Put a crane up to look down into a nest or look under a bridge uh, or try to inspect these wind farms by climbing them, not today. Or shut down a whole plant if you were going to inspect it. It's best if you leave the plant running when you inspect it. Uh, or, or fly above these areas to inspect these um, these utility lines, and um, uh, the, the drones have the ability to uh, attach different sensors, so you can inspect different things. Not only just the imagery, but uh, the uh, the condition, uh, search and recovery, right? And um, you had a, you had thermal cameras, and I tell my students, "You can go hide. We'll find you at nighttime." It's easy to uh, perhaps capture, uh, do bird counts at nighttime that are nesting, um, sending out a um, some type of buoyancy for someone who's been swept out, uh, send a drone out, starting fires, backfires. So one of the areas that I want to point out is, is survey mapping. As a GIS user, I wanted to see how this could help with me. 
and definitely in GIS world, the survey mapping, there is, and there's no, there's no question. And uh, we still often in counties, maybe cities, we're using them for maybe inspecting, but the applications are just, just incredible for what we can be doing today. Uh, I think that folks in the GIS world should explore uh, how the, uh, the use of drones can, can complement supplement what they're doing. Now, what is a drone? Well, um, th these are the drones that we use. Uh, this is, these are all DJI products. And uh, this is a uh, Swiss product. Uh, some, some offices will not allow uh, the DJI products to be used because they are um, uh, made in China. Um, but they're all much easier to use for us. Uh, we do use these and, and a few others that uh, we're, we're investing trying to keep up with the technology. Technology changes so quickly. Uh, but, you know, for me, I, I, I keep, I, I had to remind my administration early on that uh, drones are essentially tripods. It's what's carrying, it's, it's what the drone is carrying. The, it's the sensors that, we are, we're, that we're interested in. If I'm doing a project and, and the drone takes a dump, uh, I, I, I want to get my, my data back from the camera, the sensor because that's what I want to be able to use in, in whatever research or work I'm doing. Uh, the applications again are, are thermal inspecting solar panels, uh, looking at maybe insulation and in roofs, uh, trying to determine where to put a hole in the ceiling when there's a fire, you want to be, be able to rent, vent the roof. Uh, the areas in, in agriculture, farming, or looking at maybe invasive pests, maybe looking at the conditions of, of uh, trees. Uh, you can use different near infrared cameras to, to detect maybe which trees are not uh, are not well? Even even they look to us, they look fine, but maybe one agrifolia will look different than another um, with the sensor because it, it can detect changes that we can't see. If you want to do any of this and get paid commercially, uh, you do need the license directly or indirectly. If you're going to do this for fun, sure, you don't need a license. But um, uh, I would suggest hashtag if I was a student, I would look into it. And uh, we actually have a class, if you're interested, in the spring. And uh, our students are, are passing the exam. In the class, probably 90% on average score, you need 70% to pass. And uh, we have folks in industry teaching the classes and not only teaching you the material and how to pass the exam, but also uh, the applications. There are a lot of courses up online pre preparing you how to, to pass an exam so you could be licensed to perform. Uh, uh, the survey mapping, but it's good to have some applications understanding because you know, there's a lot more to it than just passing an exam. Uh, the exam, if you want to be able to do this commercially, you need an FA 107 license. And, um, and of course, you'll need a drone, but in fact, when you do take the exam, you do not even need to have touched a drone. It's not required of you to know how to fly a drone. Uh, the drones are uh, between um, from 0.55 pounds to under 55 pounds. It's under, not including 55 pounds. That's one of the questions on the exam. And to take the exam, you need to be at least 16 years old, 60 questions, all multiple choice, 70% to pass. You've got two bloody hours. If you fail, you've got to wait, 100, you've got to wait 14 days and pay another 150 bucks because the license is free. We have to pay someone $150 to uh, take all the material from you, sit you at a desk, put a camera on you, and then when you're done, you wave, and then they'll tell you immediately, immediately if you passed. And it'll be good for two years. I checked the, uh, the, the, uh, the latest st statistics. There's 160,302 licensed pilots as of December last year. Of that, there's only 7.7% .7 that are female, which is ridiculous. And our program on campus, I would say the program that I'm in, at CTE and GIS, uh, we have the largest percentage female um, ratio than any other programs. Uh, we need to have more people, more, more female involved in flying drones. In fact, uh, this was a, a drone seminar for women we had at the college, and this actually is my daughter, um, who's here today, I believe, that uh, helped with the workshop. And um, uh, to take the exam, actually I actually have a lot of materials up, up online. I will show you these slides so you can look through it. Uh, there is, I have Quizlets, there are videos up online. There's plenty of material if you want to study yourself. Um, there are um, 
uh, workbooks that you can purchase real inexpensively. When you go take the exam, they're gonna take everything away from you and sit you down at a computer. You have to take your watch off, you have to take your phone away from you. And then they'll give you one of these manuals here. That will be your reference when you take the exam. And um, uh, there are uh, a lot of material in them that they give to you that you can reference, but you only have two hours. So you need to know the material going into the exam. And I think someone here today just took the exam last a couple of weeks ago, he passed 90%. A good portion of the exam, as I told him, is a sectional chart. Essentially, you need to be able to read this chart. Sure, you can use your cell phone when you're out in the field to be able to see what airspace you're in. But when you take the exam, you can't do that. Why am I showing you all of this? Well, if you want to be able to incorporate any use of drones and survey mapping in GIS, then um, you have to have a license. And um, that's how it is. So um, here's the exam, five sections. And each of these should give you the percentage. I would say probably the, the airspace is probably a bigger portion that it says. And um, the first section is regulations. You have to know about certain regulations such as visual line of sight. You have to see the drone at all times, right? And the next section is airspace. You need to know what airspace you're in. The airspace that my college is in, I think it's uh, airspace D, at least halfway through the parking lot we nearby El Monte Airport. I'm right now in airspace D for um, Pomona Airport. You need to know these airspaces because uh, there are certain constraints in where you can fly as far as what elevation and where and, and if you can or not without any waivers or if you do need a, need a waiver. So this is uh, over in LAX area. You can determine that this here is big airspace with this blue uh, dashed line. Uh, this tells you 2,700 feet. If you're flying at 2,700 feet, which is illegal, by the way, uh, you will not hit anything. You need to know which direction the runway run, uh, is. And if it's lit, why would you need to know if the runway is lit or not? To pass the exam, you need to know that. There's actually a lot of interesting things that you learn in preparing to take the exam. And um, it's interesting. But think of the airspace as, like a, as, a, as a wedding cake. So if you're here in LAX, you are in airspace B. As you go away from the airport, then at a certain point, you're outside the airspace. Unless you go any higher, then you hit back into the airspace. So there's these different things that you have to learn in order to be used to drones in our work in GIS. And I'm going to give you some applications soon. Uh, <laughs> upside down GIS day, uh, GIS day cake. Yes. <laughs> so um, the other section is weather. Do you, have to, you have to know when ice forms on a wing. Well, as far as I know, there's no ice around where I am right now. But still, you need to know if you can fly in a tornado or not. Just study for the exam. You'll be fine. And then also, you need to know about what you can load onto a drone. Right? People are going to be attaching things to drones. Drones, normally the ones that we have, like this is a basic Mavic Pro. It doesn't work anymore. It's not made to carry things, but people still attach things to these. Although I don't think in this picture they're actually carrying that because they even take, they've not even taken the lens off the camera. Uh, this is one is the one I've been using to, to capture different vegetation types. And it's not made to carry anything, but you can. But So you need to know about these different conditions that uh, happen when you do attach things because they don't, they don't uh, fly as well. And you have to, this is probably the most math you need to know about the exam. So I'll skip over this part for you. Pretty easy. The last section is the operations. You know, is the propeller on tight? Is the battery on? Um, did you clean the lens? Things like that. Right? The one thing, like I said, they don't they don't care about if you can do or not is flying a drone. And um, actually, when I took the exam, I never even touched a drone or flown a drone. So um, that's the one thing that we like to try and incorporate. Even though our class is online, and we do we do try to meet in the field, it's optional to give students the hands-on. And I'll give you some applications here now before we're done. So what is the workflow? If I'm gonna go collect something for GIS, first thing I'm gonna do is find out what I wanna fly. Do I wanna look at topography, slopes, I wanna do some basic, basic imagery. Do I wanna identify different basic uh, weeds? I need to look at the risks. Is there a fire nearby or the power lines? Am I flying over a freeway? If I am, maybe I need insurance. $2 million insurance, no problem maybe 15 bucks and you could do it on demand on the phone. 
you check your airspace. Where are you located, right? This is over in Rehondo area. I can see the cell towers. Uh, here's the airspace D uh, for um, uh, the Almani Airport. And these are the flight lines here. This is LAX airspace right here, big airspace. You need to just know that to pass the exam. You can do it on your cell phone later. It's easy. Then I generate a flight plan. Where am I going to be flying? You need to be conscious of where you're flying and over areas, maybe the residential areas. You need to know where to draw the flight plan. Upload it to the drone. But before you do fly, you drop down some control points because we have surveyors here. And the surveyors need to know where to fly. I mean, they need to have the accuracy that they want. And then uh, I check the parts on the drone and then I take off and so forth. I'm gonna share these slides with you. I wanna give you some examples here in a moment. I establish my flight plan, this is by LA River. Uh, we take the imagery and then you process it. And the processing we use is pix for the mapper. There's also drone to map with Esri. There's different tools. Essentially it gives you an auto mosaic, which is, a, uh, which is an imagery you can bring right into GIS. You have the topography that you generate uh, you have your point clouds. The point clouds allow us to strip off the, the, the vegetation to give you the ground without the trees. The resolution on these imagery are in no, are no question. I have the best imagery of some places anywhere in the world down to where I can, I can measure distances between pavers. There's many links on here you can look at. I use even the imagery that I collect survey grade in my collector. So if I'm mapping a tree, I can place the point right on top of the tree. So how much more detail do you need it? This gives you the digital surface model. You can see this white line, that's with the trees. The red is the terrain model without the trees. You are able to make, it does best attempt to try to strip off what's on top of the ground. And there's many um, examples you can look through later here. I'm stripping off the trees. I'm trying to show the students the, the, uh, the, uh, the um, aspect and where the vegetation is on the, the uh, on the surface. And next slide. This one is showing uh, over by 605 freeway. And again, you can look through all of the slides that I have here later, but this is showing uh, the ground control points that we referenced. And these are survey grade, uh, survey grade ground control points. Uh, this would probably take for this entire area, maybe $50,000 to be able to survey this whole area over several days. We flew this in three, in three hours. Now we need to process the data. We need to go in and, and reference it to, to ground control points. And these ground control points are late placed by the surveyors. So we're trying to get it as accurate as possible. For some people, they don't care if it's that accurate. Here I'm looking at mapping some uh, watersheds. This is a, a location over in the desert where we're looking at slopes. And you can look through all of this later. I got plenty of examples for, for you. So I'll finish up with some uh, slides at the bottom at the end here. This is again, looking at topography, slope analysis, we're extracting features, because we can then take the imagery and train it with a dashboard to extract features and see how they're distributed. Uh, here, my colleague at the landfill is trying to show his surveyors the repeated accuracy from the drone data from the survey work. And, and um, uh, there's no question. And the last few slides here, again, they're just showing you the applications at the landfills where he's using it um, every week. Lastly, here is uh, a link if you want to join us on a GIS drone um, uh, uh, group meeting. Uh, every two weeks, you're welcome to join us. There's a link here. And if you want any more information, you can, you can email me. Uh, there's our website, there's our hashtag, and we have classes starting February 1st if you wanna join us. Um, you do not need the software installed unless you want to. We can give you access to that, but you can access our classes remotely. And Steve, you said I had five minutes left, or am, am I done? Uh, you're you're good on time. We'll take uh, five minutes for some Q and A now before uh, we wrap up. So, um, let's get right to it. So, one of the questions from somebody is: Have you done any environmental or sustainability work that utilizes drones? Uh, the environmental work that we're looking at is trying to. Um, we take the imagery for a, uh, a vegetative for let's say, for example, Joshua trees, we fly out a large area of Joshua trees. And then from that, we can use the, the either the Esri tools or some online dashboards where we can uh, identify what is 
a different type of vegetation or surface, and it can extract that for us. So if we're trying to count trees, we identify a few trees. It extracts them all as, as a polygon, convert them to points, and we can do some distribution analysis to see if they're clustered or if they're distributed. And then we can do it again in the future to see if there's any uh, change with any type of mitigation measures we're doing. Uh, or we're trying to look at the slope analysis, trying to determine the watershed, how much area is burned. Or, or we're looking at maybe where there's, um, we need a good base map, and then we can add the points and do the interpolation to determine what areas need to be cleaned. Yeah, so the applications, again, I'm just a landscape architect, but many of my students are in civil, survey, environmental, fire, and police. So, um, yes, we've covered a lot of those areas. If you want, to, you want some more examples, look through more, my slides or give me an email. All right, great. Um, a question from uh, Julieta Ramos. What would you recommend for somebody with a license, but who's seeking hands-on practice in a COVID environment? Well, fortunately, when we do work with drones, you can go in a, you, you can go out in the field and um, and uh, work by yourself. Or if you want to work, if you want to participate, when we're doing some exercises, give me an email. Uh, we work in small groups outside, masked, and uh, we've done some uh, field work and um, for lessons. Because, like I said, when you do the exam, as you probably know, seeing that you have the license, it doesn't doesn't teach you how to apply this into different fields. For me, it's primarily in the GIS side, and I can walk you through that workflow. And you can look through my slides that I provided to, that I will provide you. And um, but yeah, you can. Uh, there are there are um, uh, yes. So give me an email. I can I can uh, have you join us sometime in the field. Okay, very good. Um, and another question, is there a, a website or somewhere that we can verify if somebody has an FAA license? Mm, no, uh, right now, when you fly a drone, like I have, uh, I have a Mavic here. This one's called Dalek, you know, for the, for those fans. And then I've got the license plate. That license plate identifies uh, who this belongs to. Uh, so, and I can't even tell if a drone flying above me who it belongs to. And I, and even then I can't tell who, who is flying it and if they're licensed. And not like the GISP, we can, we can find out who's nearby that has a GISP. Um, so we have to carry our, our license with us. If people ask for us, ask of that, uh, I can always pull it out if need be. Yep. Okay, very good. Um, and a question from Steve Hemessy. Um, how accurate are the maps from the UAV? And I know he's thinking from a survey perspective. All right. Hi, Steve. Very good. <laughs> yes. So when I presented with Steve over at the Survey Association for Southern California, I brought along my colleague, uh, he may not be here right now, Sean Christian, because uh, he's got a civil engineering background because surveyors would not want to hear from me. They want to hear from those folks that work with this in, uh, in the industry. It does give you a report on the accuracy. I have, when I did the exercise last week, we had ground control points that were survey, surveyed by the county. And we use those as a reference and we're gonna correct it to that. We've not gone through that process yet, uh, but it will give us a, um, uh, a final report at the end. Uh, and once I have that, I can share that with you, Steve. But I'd love uh, for surveyors like Steve to accompany us and uh, help us validate this like my colleague does at the, at the LA County Sanitation. He has them, uh, they are sold on the, the value of this in surveying. Okay, very good. Um, there's a number of questions about, you know, getting training and things, but I'm gonna try and bundle them a little bit. So um, one question is, you know, are there ways you can get flight simulators um, or other ways to, to practice with drones um, before you take the test or after you take the test? And, and, and also along that same line, where might you go for doing some independent work um, as far as getting started yeah i was terrified when when i went out first to fly a drone and look for an area where there's a canyon where if it did get loose it'll hit the walls and i can get it back but if you go to walmart and buy a 50 dollars drone you're going to be worried but if you buy a basic for example dgi uh, these do have gps and if you let go of the controls don't drop it but just let go let go of the sticks it just stays there uh, but uh, yes, it'd be good to have some guidance when you do put a drone up. There are some simulators, um, but um, the simulators that I've seen, you have to have a drone to, to simulate it. Um, and some of the softwares, 
uh, I, I'm not finding a, I've not found a good one yet. You can buy little toy drones to fly around to get practice, but really, um, if you're going to buy an, an, an expensive drone, I'd probably look at a DJI to start off. You can look at DJI.com slash refurbished and find one that's been used that are reselling and always get DJI care, which allows you to crash it twice and get it replaced. <laughs> that is a good tip, especially for new drop drone operators. Well, mm -hmm. I know we have a whole bunch of additional questions that we're not going to have time to get to live, but we will capture those and hopefully uh, be able to get some answers that we post up with your slides. Um, but Warren's information is also on the screen, gisteacher at gmail.com. You can certainly reach out to him as well as the link to the programs at Rio Hondo um, and get all of your questions answered. So I wanna thank you again, Warren, uh, on behalf of the over 300 people that just uh, were listening to the talk. And again, reach out uh, to Warren and Rio Hondo also is one of our sponsors and has a, uh, a page in the exhibit hall with more information too, I believe.